Welcome. Today we're having a COVID-19 forum organized by State Representative Josh Cutler. This panel will concentrate on disability workplace matters. You can watch this forum in our viewing area on our government and public channels or on PACTV's live streaming channel Prime, which you can view at pactv.org slash live. This is also being streamed on Josh's Facebook page. If you have any questions during this forum aside from the ones you've sent to Josh, you can email them to questions at pactv.org. And for replay times, visit pactv.org slash regional. Josh will introduce his special guest for today's forum. Welcome, Josh. And they need, he needs to turn. Oh, let me start over. Sorry about that. I, <laughs> I should know better by now. I huh? um, <laughs> want to thank PAC TV and uh, you, Julie, for all the great work that you're doing to allow us to you know, host these forums. We wouldn't be able to do it without you. I really appreciate that and all the great work that your team is doing. Uh, so we have a great show for you this morning, and I'm very pleased to have along with me to co-host uh, the chair of the Joint Committee on Children, Families, and Persons with Disabilities. Uh, that's uh, Kay Khan. I've had the pleasure of serving as her vice chair for this term, and she's been wonderful to work with and is just a, an absolute uh, treasure of knowledge about uh, all these issues. And so we're delighted to have her on to help co-host the show. So welcome, Madam Chair. Kay, good to see you. Oh, and I think Kay did the same thing I did. <laughs> it's catching. <laughs> Take two. Hey, Kay. Good morning. Okay. So am I unmuted now? Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, um, Rep. Cutler, for inviting me. Sorry? You're good. Go ahead. Uh, anyway, thank you so much, um, Representative Cutler, for inviting me to uh, join you this today on this forum. Um, and it's on an issue that is so important to our committee. And I just want to really highlight the work that you've done this session on what we call the Workability Subcommittee. And we, really, this has just brought an amazing uh, light to the issues that the committee has supported uh, and the committee really is so grateful to support your efforts to promote opportunities for persons with disabilities so that they can participate and succeed in the workforce. Very important. And today's forum is another great opportunity to provide helpful information to those who may need it. And I really wanna thank all the panelists who are here today uh, for joining us. And I really look forward to learning from you. And we have some questions, uh, so we're, uh, grateful to be able to participate this morning, um, answer some questions for our uh, for individuals, uh, and get your advice actually on for individuals with disabilities um, who have work related questions. So really looking forward to the panel this morning, and thank you, again, uh, Vice Chair Cutler, for inviting me to join you. I'm delighted great. to be here. Great. Well, that's great. Well, we'll we'll jump right in. Let me introduce our panelists, and then we're going to give each each of them a chance to just quickly. Tell us about their organization, and then we'll, we'll move over to some questions. Um, wanted to let uh, folks listening live on PAC TV or on, on Facebook uh, let you know that you, you're welcome to share questions with us, and we'll try to, to address them on air if we're able to. Um, so first up, uh, well, let me introduce all three of the panelists. Uh, we have Brian Forsythe, who is the Project Coordinator and Benefits Counseling for Work Without Limits out of UMass, great organization. Uh, delighted to have Kerry Mahoney, who's the Director of Education and Outreach for the ARC of Massachusetts, very well known, great advocacy organization. And Tom Murphy is a senior attorney at the Disability Law Center, which is a great resource for folks. Um, so we're very pleased to have a distinguished panel. I'm gonna now turn it over to Brian first to just uh, give us a quick intro and welcome. So Brian, take it away. Thank you, Josh, for having me today. I'm, uh, I'm honored to be here. So let me tell you a little bit about Work Without Limits and what I do. Work Without Limits is an initiative of UMass Medical School's Commonwealth Medicine. It primarily ma is made up of a couple of parts. Uh, and we have a, an employer engagement team whose job is to instruct and advise employers on hiring, maintaining, uh, and promoting individuals with disabilities in the workplace. We also have a small employment network that assists clients with ticket to work uh, issues uh, of, you know, while they're working. Um, and we have the benefits counseling team, which is what I'm part of. I'm actually a, a CWIC or a community work incentive counselor. 
uh, which is part of a WIPA grant or Work Incentive Planning Assistance paid for or funded by Social Security. Our main goal is to work with individuals receiving benefits, either SSI or SSDI, who are working or are looking to go to work. And our job is to help them understand what's going to happen to all of their benefits, their SSI, SSDI, Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, public housing, when they go to work. In other words, what's going to happen to those benefits? Why will you be most likely better off working than just staying on benefits alone? Who do you have to tell? What do you have to tell them? And we're also there in case there's an issue, we can help resolve that issue with any of those public benefit systems. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Brian, that great introduction. And now we'll, we'll let uh, uh, Kerry join us and just uh, give a quick hello. Kerry, unmute yourself. <laughs> hello, Kerry. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, the invitation to participate today. Um, Carrie Mahoney from the ARC of Massachusetts. Um, hopefully many of you know about uh, the ARC. Um, we're uh, the state organization, um, and we work across the state with uh, 17 affiliates who actually do more of programs and services. What we do is um, our main mission is advocacy, education, outreach. So we're uh, busy working with all the legislators, um, trying to make sure the voice of people with disabilities is well heard and their caregivers and families. And the other thing about the ARC is that we also link with the, um, the ARC in the United States and other uh, state affiliates throughout the country. So, so happy to be here. Thank you. Great. All right. And uh, last, certainly not least, uh, Tom, and he already unmuted himself, so he's, he's learning quick. We have Tom Murphy, the senior attorney at the Disability Law Center. Tom, welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having me on today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So Disability Law Center is the protection and advocacy system for Massachusetts. We provide legal advocacy to promote the rights of people with disabilities uh, <clears throat> through legal advice, direct representation, and by engaging in systemic activities such as litigation. As a protection and advocacy agency, we have authority under federal statutes to monitor uh, and investigate allegations of abuse and neglect any place where a person with a disability lives or receives services or treatment. Uh, and that can include hospitals, nursing homes, congregate living facilities, home, uh, schools, uh, juvenile detention facilities, and jails and prisons. Uh, our monitoring authority is very broad. It provides us with a wide range of access, including unaccompanied access to records and information, as well as to the individuals themselves who are being served and the physical spaces within any facility. We also prioritize certain types of legal issues for individual legal advocacy, uh, such as employment, housing, public accommodations, education, voting rights, and human rights issues. Some of the COVID-related issues that we've been working on over the last couple of months include working uh, on providing uh, input to the Commonwealth's uh, Crisis Standards of Care Plan, working with group homes to ensure that residents and staff uh, are adequately protected and using PPE and addressing safety issues, uh, monitoring hospitals and nursing homes for their preparedness and response around health and safety issues and concerns, advocacy related to hospital visitation policies, collaborating with other advocates on issues related to special education, uh, working with state agencies around issues uh, regarding reporting and transparency. And we also provide individual advocacy on housing issues. Um, we've done advocacy on issues related to the Commonwealth's new mask order, which I'd like to point out does contain an exemption for medical related reasons, uh, as well as employment issues, including accommodations that employees may need either while they're working from home uh, or as they transition back to their usual physical workspace. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, appreciate your expertise. Uh, we'll turn it over now. We're going to do some, we, some, we have some great questions that we're going to um, put to you all to get some great information out. And I'm, for the first question, I'm going to turn it over to Madam Chair, who if you could <coughs> unmute yourself uh, and then uh, jump in with the first question, we will uh, we'll get started. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, let's see. We um, 
uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you, um, the panelists, for being here today. And uh, I think that as um, uh, as we have been sort of moved into this uh, COVID-19 uh, situation, I really want to thank the advocates uh, for the disability community. Everyone has been um, amazing. And we've had an opportunity, um, Vice Chair Cutler and myself, uh, to be on uh, Zoom calls, uh, many Zoom calls with the uh, many of the advocates, and and really uh, thank you all for for the amount of uh, support and work that you've been doing, so that we can manage the situation that we're in this unprecedented situation. Uh, so I just um, I do have some questions that I thought it might be uh, worth um, taking a look at, and uh, just maybe some questions first. I'll start out with. Uh, question for Tom Murphy, uh, and again, thank you for your presentation. So I'm just wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about uh, what a ten what should a tenant do, for example, if they're living in a situation where the landlord um, uh, provides sort of sends a notice uh, to uh, quit or take some other action to, and puts pressure on them to leave uh, the situation that they're in. Uh, maybe even go as far as changing locks or um, shutting utilities. And so we're very worried about folks who, uh, you know, with disabilities who are living in situations that landlords might want to see change. So I just wondered if you could maybe talk about that a little bit. Sure. So uh, first and foremost, <clears throat> Massachusetts uh, enacted an eviction moratorium, and that is currently in place. And that means that all non-essential evictions are on hold uh, until either August 18th or 45 days after the state of emergency is lifted, whichever is sooner. Although the legislation also allows the governor to extend the moratorium in up, up to 90 day increments if, uh, if the governor feels that that will be necessary. Uh, so currently evictions can only be brought uh, where a tenant violates a term or condition of their lease and engages in criminal activity. And uh, the violation may impact the health or safety of other residents or anyone else who is legally on the premises. So in other words, evictions right now cannot be filed in court. Uh, and remember in Massachusetts, an eviction case is called summary process. Uh, so summary process cases cannot be filed. Uh, landlords cannot terminate tenancies by serving uh, a notice to quit or any other notice that a tenancy is being uh, terminated. Uh, and for eviction cases that were filed and pending before the moratorium was, was enacted, uh, those cases are all on hold um, and any deadlines are uh, extended until after the emergency uh, order is lifted uh, and, and courts reopen for, for full business. Um, importantly as well, constables and sheriffs, which often have the task ultimately of moving someone out of their uh, apartment after they've been evicted, uh, can no longer do that. They will not be acting on what are known as executions um, while the moratorium is in place. For landlords, it is illegal for a landlord to take what's known as self-help uh, to evict someone by changing the locks, shutting off utilities, anything of that nature um, that is illegal. It's also uh, illegal to threaten or harass a tenant to try to get the tenant to voluntarily um, leave their apartment. And, uh, and this applies to all tenants, whether they have a lease, whether they're a tenant at will, um, or even a tenant in sufferance, which is a person who is living uh, under neither a lease or uh, any other sort of formal arrangement. Um, so any tenant who is illegally being forced out of their home or receives a notice to quit or, or is being harassed by their landlord uh, should um, either, if, if there's a, a physical action happening, like someone is there trying to physically move them out, uh, in that instance, they should call the police. Um, in other instances, they can call the attorney general, the Massachusetts attorney general's office. Uh, they have a consumer hotline, the number is 617. 727-8400, and I believe we're including the website for the Attorney General's Office in this broadcast as well. 
um, or they can contact DLC or their local legal services office, which uh, in the Plymouth area is South Coastal County County's legal service. Well, I think that that information is really helpful. I guess the one question I have is, um, wouldn't that apply anyway, even if there, we weren't in an emergency situation? Um, aren't, aren't tenants protected, you know, particularly those with any kind of disability uh, in any case, um, without even being in the situation that we're in now? I'm just wondering um, if you might mention that or talk about that a little. Of course. Um, so yes, every tenant is protected from what are known as self-help measures. So, um, so landlords cannot take it upon themselves to to evict someone or move someone out without having engaged in the formal court process, which is known as summary process. So, so that th there is no change to that. Um, the biggest change which has has occurred as a result of the COVID crisis is the eviction moratorium which means that landlords cannot even start that process. They cannot send a notice to quit, which is usually the first step in, in that eviction process, um, and they cannot file cases. So, so there is, um, except in emergency situations where, where the health or safety of others is at stake. Mm -hmm. um, so that is the biggest difference, that landlords can take no affirmative action at all um, with respect to any tenant to uh, to either initiate or engage in the eviction process uh, until again August eighteenth or forty five days after the state of emergency is lifted. Tom, can I jump in? Um, um, you know, in, in the in the workplace, obviously, you know, as we sort of start the transition back to work for many sectors, uh, obviously in the workplace, if you're a person with a disability. Um, in, in some cases, you may need a, a, some kind of accommodation made, uh, a reasonable accommodation made in the workplace. So I guess the question is, for, for folks with disability, employees with disabilities who um, are working from home, uh, are they entitled to reasonable accommodations in that scenario? Uh, they are, yes. So uh, just as um, prior to uh, the, the COVID crisis, um, Employees with disabilities are entitled to reasonable accommodations in their workplace. So um, just the same as if the physical workplace, uh, again, prior to the crisis was a, an office space or the, the, uh, the premises owned by, by the business owner, um, the, the employee would be entitled to the same uh, types of reasonable accommodations as they are working from home. Now, obviously what those accommodations are will um, necessarily differ if they're working from home. There may be some overlap, but there may be some changes as well. Um, so uh, the same rules apply as, uh, as previously with respect to reasonable accommodations. Uh, employees are required to, in most instances, uh, make the request for the accommodation and uh, establish that there is a, a disability related link, that the employee needs the accommodation in order to perform an essential function of their job. Uh, and again, uh, just to reiterate, an accommodation itself is any change uh, to the asp uh, different aspects of the person's job, uh, changes to policies, uh, physical changes in the workplace, um, any sort of change that an employee with a disability needs in order to perform the essential functions of their job. And okay. then once that request is made, the employer is required under the law to engage in what's known as an interactive process with them in order to determine an, an accommodation which will actually work and be provided. So the interactive, interactive process really is the key to reasonable accommodation for employees with disabilities. And it's important, especially for employees, to be aware that it's a two-way street. So employers, as well as employees, are expected to engage in the interactive process uh, in good faith. And uh, so sometimes that means that an employee does not necessarily get the specific accommodation that they've first requested. The purpose of the interactive process 
is to establish an accommodation which is going to work for both the employer and the employee and give the employee the ability to perform the essential functions of their job. And sometimes that's going to be a little bit different. Employers during that process um, can suggest alternatives that might be easier to implement or, or less costly. And as long as the uh, accommodation that is being offered by the employer who's engaging in that interactive process in good faith, uh, as long as that is effective, meaning that it allows the employee to perform the essential functions of his or her job, then it is an, an accommodation that the employee should accept. And then let me ask one quick follow-up and then I'll, I'll turn it back over to Kay. Um, you know, that, that addressed in the, in the home when you're working from home, but what about a um, person with disabilities who's uh, outside of the workplace somewhere else, such as, uh, you know, traveling or commuting to work or um, in a public area? And, and when they encounter discrimination or have experienced a lack of accessibility, what can be done about those sort of issues? Uh, outside of the workplace and in, in other aspects of, of, yes. public, of life in the public? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> obviously, I think most people are aware that discrimination can occur uh, in many different ways with respect to uh, people with disabilities. Uh, it can include denial of services in places of public accommodation. So, for example, if a person requires the use of a service animal and they're denied entry to a store, uh, that would be considered uh, discrimination. Uh, a lack of effective communication. Uh, so, for example, someone who is deaf, who is denied an ASL interpreter when they visit a doctor or a lawyer's office. Uh, and there can be physical barriers as well that can constitute discrimination. So, for example, in relatively new construction, if, if a building is constructed that's not fully accessible, or there are existing barriers in older buildings that can fairly easily and inexpensively be removed, um, but are not, that can be a form of discrimination as well. Uh, it can also be discrimination to fa for a failure to modify a policy where a person with a disability needs a modification to that policy in order to fully participate in the particular activity. So for example, a person with an intellectual disability um, may uh, require that when they're voting, they have someone with them to help them through the voting process. Uh, if they're denied that support person, uh, that can be a form of discrimination as well. So um, any of these forms of discrimination are, can be actionable. And in Massachusetts, complaints can be filed with the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination or depending on the circumstances, other, other state agencies like the Architectural Access Board for um, buildings and fit physical barriers. Uh, and there are also various federal agencies that um, accept complaints of discrimination based on disability as well. And again, it depends on the particular issue or the setting. So that could be either the Department of Justice or the Department of Education, if we're talking about someone who's, who's being denied effective services uh, or is being discriminated against in an educational setting. And uh, Disability Law Center can help guide individuals through, um, through that alphabet soup of agencies and uh, help them try to figure out which agency would, would be the best to address their particular problem. Great. So uh, I just want to, um, we're going to um, turn it over to Kay for a question, but I wanted to, to, to address to all of our panelists, feel free, um, you know, even if we're addressing a question to one particular person here, if you have some expertise, you'd like to, to jump in with that, feel free to kind of raise your hand or, or jump in. We want, we don't, uh, we welcome uh, a little bit of uh, conversation back and forth. Uh, so I guess we're going to turn to, to Brian now and uh, uh, Chairwoman Khan uh, has uh, some other questions, I believe. So Brian, you're in the hot seat. <laughs> okay. And Kay, uh, you know, you did the same thing I did. You got to unmute yourself. I'm sorry, I set a bad tenor for the start of this. <laughs> Go ahead. So I actually, um, I just wanted to make a recommendation uh, before I uh, ask some questions. And I just thought that it's really great to hear from, um, hold on. Not that person. <laughs> um, it's really, it, no, I think I want to thank um, uh, Tom. 
uh, for the uh, the information that he gave us. And I just hope that there's going to be something posted on the website because I think it's really helpful if people know who to call or where to turn. And uh, so I think that's really great information to uh, definitely have out there because that's often uh, when you're in a difficult situation, it's hard to know where to turn. So having that information posted, I think, and maybe he already said that he would be doing that, but I think that would be a good thing to do. Um, so for Brian, um, and again, thank you for your, uh, your presentation. And so I'm just wondering, you know, in the situation that we're in, I mean, there are questions. Um, so for example, with the economy starting to open up again, you know, what should individuals who are looking for uh, for work uh, uh, to be aware of. I think i um, just wondering if you might be able to address that. Well, yeah, it's going to go back to, you know, what an individual with a disability or collecting benefits has always had to con concern themselves about. You know, they have to know what benefits they're receiving. They also want to know what are the impact of those benefits when they go back to work. So they're going to want to be able to know, you know, um, what, how many hours are they looking at? What's the rate of pay? Is that going to affect my SSI? Is it going to affect my SSDI? So really there's a number of factors uh, that are going to be in, um, impacted by that. So if someone, like say, if someone's on SSI, they need to know that as soon as they go back to work, the amount of money that I'm going to receive on SSI is going to go down. So it's important that I understand that, you know, when I start the job search process. If someone's on SSDI, they need to know that, you know, I can work for a certain amount of time you know, at any rate of pay without it being affected by my, without my benefits being affected. And once again, you know, working with a benefit specialist or a community work incentive counselor, which is what I do, you know, can help them understand where they are in that process. Um, we usually advocate with people on road ground when you're looking for a job, think about what's going to happen to your benefits and what you want to happen to your benefits before you, you know, before, because you, before you accept the job so that you know upfront, See, this is the job I want, this is what it's gonna to do to my benefits, and you know, I'm comfortable with that. Uh, the one thing you don't wanna do is to go out and you know, get a job you think it's a great idea, then later on, find out that it's going to cause a problem because that's only gonna cause stress that you really don't need. So I'm just wondering, um... So, you know, obviously there's, there, it seems that you are a benefits counselor yes. or you provide benefits counseling. So how does one, who, how do they know who to contact or is there, is there a, um, a number that you can put out there that, that uh, people could think about? And I'm also wondering if you're, you work with Mass Rehab because that's one of the agencies that we oversee on the committee. So I didn't know whether some of that is uh, through Mass Rehab. So well, question. there are actually two different programs in Massachusetts that provide benefits counseling through the WIPA or Work Incentive Planning Assistance Grant funded by Social Security. One is Work Without Limits Benefits Counseling. We cover Middlesex County, Worcester County, Hamden, Hampton, Franklin, and Berkshire counties, and seven counties in New York. The remainder of the counties, Suffolk, Essex, Bristol, Duke, uh, the Cape and the Islands, those are covered by a program called Project Impact which is actually run out of Mass Rehab in Boston. Okay. Um, if someone lives in our territory, they can always call us at 877-937-9675. If they're in Mass Rehab or Project Impacts territory, they can be reached at 1-800-734-7475. And in both cases, the service is going to be the same. You're going to be meeting with a, a, you know, an individualized, meet with a benefits counselor, who will go over what benefits you have, what your job plans are, and how those two are going to mesh together. Um, Mass Rehab, although, is actually probably our largest referral source. So we refer, you know, we work with Mass Rehab, we work with, you know, Mass Commission for the Blind, uh, DDS, uh, and all of the smaller agencies will all funnel referrals through to us because they're all doing the same thing. Their job is to help people with disabilities get back to work. And we learned a long time ago that if you couldn't address the benefit portion of it, it's not going to be as successful as you hope. So does that mean that, um, so I'm just wondering how that works with the employer. Uh, so for example, 
uh, if someone is coming to you for benefit counseling, mm -hmm. do you uh, also work with the employer or is it up to the employee to uh, try to address that with the employer or can they get some support around that? It's usually left to the individual to do that. Uh, and our counseling will be, help that individual more or less you know, understand what's going to go on so that they can make that choice. So then they'll go to the employer and say, gee, I can only, you know, I would only like to work part-time rather than full-time, right? We usually see clients at the beginning of their job search process. Mm -hmm. So that they're going to know, oh, the best thing for me is to only work for part, you know, work part-time. So they're only going to look for part-time employment. Other people are saying, I would really like to, you know, get off of benefits, all right, so we're going to counsel them. You know, this is how it's going to, what you'd have to do. And that's going to give them obviously a lot more leeway when they're talking to an employer. Mm -hmm. um, Frank, um, if I, I ask a question, um, and then Tom, uh, right after that, happy to, to grab you. Um, Brian, what, uh, what is the impact of the stimulus, the federal stimulus payments, um, you know, the $1,200 in different amounts, uh, what is the impact that would have on a person, uh, uh, with a person's benefits? Um, the short answer is really nothing, okay. but I mean, we really should walk it through step by step for individuals on SSDI or social security disability insurance, which is an, just that it's federally funded long-term disability insurance. There's no impact at all because that benefit, that EIP or the stimulus payment is unearned income and has no effect for individuals on SSI. It's not going to be considered income on the day that it's, you know, it, it's received. And it's not going to again go against their two thousand dollar resource limit for twelve months after receipt, so it won't affect SSI. Uh, the VA sort of mirrors the Social Security system in that there is a needs based program, which is disability uh, disability um, pension, and then there is disability payments, which are non. And in both cases, they're going to follow the same rules. It's not for people who are receiving disability payments, service connected. It's not going to affect them at all. For people receiving disability pension, it won't be considered income in the month received, and it won't be considered part of the resource for 12 continuous months after that. Okay. All right. Tom, did you want to jump in on something there? No, I, I, thanks. I, I just wanted to add to Brian's previous question, uh, answer to Representative Khan's question regarding uh, working with employee employers as someone transitions back to work from benefits. Um, I wanted to point out that, that that dovetails with reasonable accommodation because a lot of times an employee uh, who is going back to work uh, after having received benefits or while they're still receiving benefits uh, is going to need to engage in some sort of reasonable accommodation process. Not all the time, but, but many times. Uh, so there really is um, a, a, a synthesis there between transitioning off of benefits and reasonable accommodation. And we've worked very closely with work without limits and with Brian in particular in the past in uh, training individuals to understand that it's important to get legal advice regarding reasonable accommodations that might be required so that a person can truly be successful as they transition back to work. Great. Uh, so Carrie, we want to get you involved. Uh, if you could unmute yourself, I think uh, uh, Chairwoman Khan is going to uh, jump in with some questions. We good? Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so the uh, so you're whoops, I'm my out, or I'm unmuted, I guess. Okay, You're good. <laughs> yeah, so um, you know, we've really uh, we do a lot of work with ARC, so I'm really pleased that, that you're here uh, this afternoon. So I just I had a few questions and I just wondered, um, so the so what should a family, uh, I, I'm just thinking about a family um, in terms of an emergency plan. If does a, do families are they encouraged to have some sort of emergency plan uh, when you know, particularly right now when we're in this situation, um, and what would that look like? What would having an emergency plan actually look like? Okay, sure. Um, yeah, yes, actually, um, we provided a webinar a few weeks ago just on what what is emergency planning. Because in this crisis, it really brings it to light for so many of us. Um, so, you know, having good documentation about your loved ones, um, their needs, their medications, their contacts. Um, people complete what we call a letter of intent, which is not a legal document, but it's a document that really encompasses all of the um, 
information that an alternative caregiver would need to know. There's also legal planning, which is very, very, very important. Um, having a will, um, having a power of attorney, um, having health care proxy in place, uh, that sort of thing. And then on the other side of um, planning is also looking at perhaps a special needs trust. But I think what's most important right now is really kind of looking at your family networks and your own support systems. Um, I just heard about a family this morning that uh, both the parents have tested uh, positive for COVID-19. So the mom is in the hospital and the dad is at home um, trying to care for his uh, son. And so, uh, you know, just looking at what are the resources out there if you were not able to provide care. And um, you can also work with family support centers to do this. Um, your uh, people from the Department of Developmental Services, sometimes you're going to need alternative people to come in, and sometimes you have those natural supports. So very important. That's great. Uh, I also heard that the ARC has started some focus group. Uh, and I yes, yes. To talk a little bit about that and what, what that's all about. And sure. Talk. So, you know, it's, it's important that we're always listening to families because families and caregivers and individuals, they're the ones, you know, with the boots on the ground. And uh, we need to know what's going well, what's not going well, and what are their recommendations. Um, so anyways, in the past couple of weeks, we've we've done three focus groups. Um, then one who ha uh, for families who have their loved ones at home with significant behavioral challenges. Um, another one for uh, in families who have their kids in residential services, and many of them are going on two months now without being able to see their their sons and daughters. Um, and then another focus group we did for, was for adults that are home without day programs. So as you can imagine, um, stress and anxiety are very high right now. Um, especially for fa families who have ki those kids with behavioral challenges. They're out of their routine. Many are not able to, uh, you know, engage in virtual learning. Um, and so it's the onus of the, you know, the parent to be able to provide the activities, the structures, and that sort of thing. Um, many times needing more one-to-one -one type of situations. Um, another problem is not everybody's comfortable about bringing strangers into the home, even though that may be available. Um, there's a still a need for more PPE uh, for both the families and the caregivers. Um, you know, families are going through their PPE supplies much faster because their kids are home all the time. And so, you know, being able to access that. Um, in terms of, you know, families who are facing uh, not being able to see their kids for a couple of months, it's heartbreaking for some. And just, you know, more recommendations on how can families engage with their, their loved ones. Um, and, you know, even be able to do, you know, use PPE to go visit, uh, maybe go for a walk, uh, you know, but, but other than just doing technology FaceTime. And then, uh, you know, there's a lot of anxiety, too, about the reopening. What is that going to look like? Um, because it's a challenge both for the families who are returning to work, as well as what will the new adult or uh, school services look like? And how are they going to be able to balance both? So it's uh, not an easy time, as <laughs> you can imagine. So, um, Rep. Cutler, if you don't mind, if I could just put in a little plug for Newton. Of course. That I, that I, <laughs> since I'm representing Newton. Yes, uh, very, and very well, I might add. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and just a little um, something that I found out about I wasn't aware of, but uh, the Newton Parks and Recreation Department apparently has uh, something uh, three times a day. They have a program. Uh, that is offering um, people, you know, young people that are at home uh, that have disabilities. It gives a little bit of respite to the family members. And apparently they offer dance programs and, uh, you know, some physical activities, all kinds of activities that apparently are helpful because many of these uh, people are people that have had jobs or, or have some uh, jobs that they're doing in their communities. 
And now they're not able to do that. So they're kind of lost uh, in terms of what they can do during the day. So apparently three times a day, the Newton Parks and Recreation Department has a pro has programs that uh, these folks can tune into and uh, do all kinds of activities that are provided by the by the program. So I just throw that out. You might want to take a look at it. Maybe maybe you'd like to do it down at, have them do it down in your community, uh, Rep Cutler. But um, uh, I did hear that it's been very successful and uh, that the the folks that are participating are very excited about it and love it. Great. So. Well, that, that's a good segue. Uh, again, we're here, you know, being broadcast through PAC TV and we want to uh, emphasize the importance of community access television and thank the good folks at PAC TV for doing this. Uh, but we're also going to be rebroadcast on the Talking Information Center. And I should note that um, we'll be uh, putting this up on YouTube and we, we will make closed captioning available. We aren't able to do it for this sh particular show just for technical reasons, um, but um, we will be doing that and also uh, be rebroadcasting the Talking Talking Information Center and hopefully up on, on Newton Cable Access and other areas as well. Um, so thank you all uh, for that. Um, Kara, I had, I had a follow-up kind of question for you, if you don't mind. Um, many folks, uh, many IDD individuals uh, rely on job coaches for their work. How is job coaching looking moving forward in this era of COVID-19? Well, there's, you know, it, it's a work in progress, <laughs> I think. Um, you know, there, as um, uh, Representative Khan uh, talked about, there's w some wonderful virtual programs going on. Um, lots of different, you know, exercise and music and cooking and crafts. And um, a lot of family support centers are providing them as well as day programs. I did, uh, was speaking with somebody whose daughter receives job support through um, Best Buddies and um, they were, she was participating in some virtual programs on um, how to return back to work. So kind of really uh, examining, you know, what kind of, you know, so the social distancing, the mask, you know, what's going to be expected of her. So a lot of prep right now, and that can be done beautifully through virtual um, programs. I think we're we're learning far more on how to provide these services virtually. So with check-ins and Facebook time and, um, you know, just being able to connect with people. I, I think people are just, we're just all learning how to do things differently. Yeah. I just, I thought of another question, if you don't mind, and this might be actually more for Tom, but feel free anyone to jump at this. Um, in terms of, so for employers, can they ask, what kind of questions can they ask their employees related to COVID-19 symptoms? And then as sort of a second part, can employers ask their employees who have symptoms, you know, COVID symptoms to stay home? Um, Tom, could you address those? Anybody else who wants to jump in afterwards? Yeah, that, that's, that's really a great question. Um, and, it's, and it's so relevant um, today and, and will become more relevant, I think, as, as the weeks go on and, and more and more uh, businesses start to open up and people start to transition back to their regular workplaces. Uh, normally, uh, there are restrictions on the types of questions that employers can ask. Uh, about medical issues or disability related issues. Uh, <clears throat> but um, with respect to COVID, uh, it's, it's still, because it's so new, it's, it's unclear whether having COVID itself uh, would in and of itself constitute a disability if someone uh, recovers uh, and doesn't have any uh, underlying health conditions that are exacerbated or ongoing issues uh, related to their having had the virus. Um, it's, it's unclear at this point whether they would be protected under anti-discrimination laws as a person with a disability. Um, but either way, the EEOC has come out with some pretty good guidance on the transition back to work types of issues that you're asking about. And um, specifically, the EEOC has taken the position that employers can ask questions of employees related to symptoms of COVID-19. Uh, and as well as take their temperature uh, and possibly actually perform tests as long as the, the tests that they're using are accurate and reliable. Um, query exactly what, what that's going to mean, but that's the position that the EEOC has taken. Um, it's important to note, though, that any information that's collected in this regard about employees who are coming back to the workplace must be kept confidential in a separate file, separate from their regular employment file. Um, 
So, you know, I, I would caution employers uh, against using COVID-19, though, as an excuse to kind of get into other types of uh, disability related questions and issues with their employees. Normally, employers should not do that unless they have a particular reason for doing so. For example, if an employee requests a reasonable accommodation. Um, and, uh, and it's also important for employers, I think, to remember that employees coming back to the workplace uh, will, um, will need accommodations that are directly related to COVID and may be different from the types of accommodations that they were, uh, that they had in place before the crisis started. Um, so for example, an employee may need um, to uh, have their, their job temporarily changed so that they don't have as much contact, physical contact with coworkers or with customers. They may, may need some physical change in the workplace so that they have more protection um, if they're immunocompromised or otherwise more vulnerable to, uh, to the virus or, or bad effects from, from having uh, gotten it. Um, and so just, just as with other reasonable accommodation issues, the employer should address all of those quickly and engage in a good faith interact, interactive process uh, with, with the employee. Um, some of those accommodations also could include at this point continuing to work from home, even if an employer says we want everyone to come back in. Uh, if an employee, again, who is at a greater risk um, because of an underlying medical issue uh, needs to continue to work from home, that can be considered an ongoing reasonable accommodation. Okay. Well, we're going to turn it back over to Kay. just want to uh, acknowledge we have about 15 minutes left, and I, I do want to save time at the end for each of you to plug your contact info again and organizations. So. Uh, just keep that in mind. So I think uh, Madam Chair is going to um, has a question for, for maybe a wild card question. Who's who? <laughs> well, <laughs> let's see what direction she goes in. Okay. Uh, well, I, I just think that um, it would be interesting to talk about uh, how the landscape has changed uh, with COVID ID, um, and uh, certainly for the disability community in the workplace, at home, and daily living. Um, I, I, I feel there's really a silver lining here because it seems to me, and this is just my perspective, um, that there's a lot more out there to accommodate folks with disabilities. As you mentioned, all the virtual programs that are out there uh, and um, just uh, being able to do what we're doing this morning, which is really educating the public about what is available for folks with disabilities. And, I, and again, I also have to really commend all of you for the work that you've been doing uh, for uh, the disability community. Uh, but I just wonder if you might um, talk a little bit about, and it's really open to any one of you, um, you know, how, you've seen, how you see the landscape changing and what, what we can really anticipate in the future, because I don't think this is gonna go away uh, uh, quickly. And who knows, uh, maybe I think we have learned a lot of things um, at this time that will help us move forward in very positive ways for the disability community. So just wondered what your thoughts are and how you see things um, as we go forward under the circumstances that we're in. It's open to any one of you. <laughs> uh, I'll jump in if, if that's okay. Um, I, I think that uh, there will be uh, potentially more emphasis on allowing employees to telecommute, which in the past um, has been somewhat contentious in terms of reasonable accommodation issues. Uh, obviously, there are many jobs that, that can't be performed at home, um, but for those that can, I think we're, we're learning through this process that telecommuting uh, can be a very effective way to um, have employees perform their jobs uh, and um, and not have to engage in activities such as commuting, which for many people, especially in the eastern part of the state, I happen to live in the western part of the state, so it's not as, as bad here, but um, uh, issues like commuting can really um, be a drain on employ employers and employees, I think. And so I think we are learning a lot about what it means to, to perform a, a job and, and do it well. I agree with, with, yeah, I agree with Tom. I mean, we're, we're learning a lot. Even in our own, uh, you know, our own setting, uh, prior to COVID-19, working from home was frowned upon. 
And now there are departments that are saying, it's just going to be the new norm. And that's going to make it a lot more opportunities for individuals with disabilities, a lot of whom can't commute and really do need to work from home. And those jobs are very hard to find. I think it's going to, we're going to find now that those opportunities are going to be a lot more uh, than they had been in the past. Hey, Brian, can yeah, I ask? So I, oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, uh, Brian, I was going to ask a quick follow-up just because um, yeah. we're just, just uh, actually just today, uh, was announced by Governor Baker's team that uh, some of the new unemployment, the extended unemployment benefits, the extra 13 will now be uh, eligible, people are now eligible for. And mm -hmm. so it made me think just, you know, the intersection of unemployment payments and, and people who have disabilities getting their benefits. Could you address that situation if someone's unemployed, receiving sure. uh, unemployment and then how that would affect their, uh, their benefits as a person with a disability? Yeah. Certainly, well, we're going to have to do the same thing. We're going to have to go through it benefit by benefit. For someone on SSDI, unemployment, including regular unemployment and the PUC, are considered unearned income and therefore have no benefit, no effect on SSDI at all. For people on SSI or supplemental security income, which is a needs-based program, that income is going to be counted and most likely will actually cause someone SSI to be suspended, not stopped, suspended while they're receiving the asset while they're receiving it but given the amount of money that they're they could potentially receive on S on unemployment they'll actually be better off financially it won't affect anybody's health insurance uh because mass health has already made that determination and medicare doesn't look at income um the one issue that we do have with individuals on ssi is because that income is counted and they are held to that a two thousand dollar resource limit that's going to have to be monitored, uh, but there are ways, you know, they could, you know, put the money into an ABLE account or if they have a special needs trust to do that, uh, because unlike the stimulus payment, you know, the unemployment, it would go against that $2,000 resource limit. But with careful planning, you know, once again, you're going to be better off financially and it's not going to have a very large impact because even if it stops your SSI while you get it, when the unemployment runs out with a simple phone call from Social Security, the SSI will come back. Okay, great. Um, so uh, again, we're, we're, we're almost out of time here, but uh, Madam Chair, do you have uh, any more questions you wanted to throw to our panel? Sure. <laughs> so uh, yes, I'll ask uh, one more question. And um, first of all, I'm just wondering, I mean, all of the information that you've provided us today is really helpful. Are you, I think, I heard somebody mention webinar. Are you doing any invitations to webinars to folks who have disabilities or families that are coping with a, a family member with a disability? And also just uh, to add to that a little bit, how, how can people get involved with organizations? Uh, I think it would be really nice uh, if folks know that there is a way to get involved to be helpful. Sure, um, this, I'll, um, I'd be happy to, uh, let you know what's going on at the Ark of Massachusetts. So uh, we've been offering webinars four days a week throughout the COVID uh, crisis. And um, Mondays uh, is with our executive director, Leo Sarkisian. And basically he gives an overview of what um, uh, things happen in the state in terms of policy, in terms of services, in terms of legislation, and also what's happening on the federal uh, side as well. On Tuesdays, I do a webinar and provide people with problem solving and information and support. Uh, so last week, uh, we heard from a family who, who shared her story about getting through a day in her life. She's caring for her 27-year-old son um, who's in a wheelchair and uh, needs total care. So um, it's just wonderful to just to hear the resilience from these families and what they're going through and how they're getting through day by day. We've also had some information on stress and anxiety. How do you manage that during this time? Um, on Thursdays, Maura Sullivan, our Director of Government Affairs, provides an overview of what's going on in the state. Um, we've done a lot around um, access to uh, a support person with the Disability Law Center and others in terms of if your sons or daughters needed to be hospitalized. And um, then on Fridays, we have Ellen Taverna, our policy officer, and she links with the ARC of the United States. 
and has provided several webinars and speakers going on the federal issues around the CARES Act, um, the stimulus payments, and now um, we're monitoring the HEROES Act that we're hoping that will get passed because there's a lot of uh, disability services in there that we're we're getting our fingers crossed that it's going to, um, you know, be passed in the Senate. So anyways, please feel free to hop on our website um, and uh, check us out. We probably update our website maybe once, sometimes once a day. Things are moving fast. Uh, things are changing fast. And um, we want to always hear from you. So please join us and please reach out. Great. Thanks. That sounds great. Does anybody else have uh, something uh, to add to that? Yeah, if, if people are interested in learning more about Work Without Limits, we do have a very robust website, uh, workwithoutlimits.org. We have a page on COVID-19 resources that are updated on, you know, as information comes in. There's also a blog um, that people can read on how the pet stimulus payments and unemployment affect benefits. Um, we also work with a number of employers. We're part of a national organization called Disability In. And if employers are interested in learning more about helping individuals with disabilities return and stay or be promoted in the job, we contact Work Without Limits would be more than happy to reach out to you. Fabulous. And, uh, and I'll just add the best way to uh, get information about DLC is to drop us an email indicating that you would like to be on our email list. Uh, so that can be at mail at dlc-ma.org uh, or visit our website, which is uh, dlc-ma.org. We have a lot of information there uh, or like our Facebook page. And, and that's where we uh, will announce any initiatives, trainings, um, or that sort of thing that, that we're planning. I think Amazing. For uh, folks who, oh, sorry, we had. I, I guess we just had a brief glitch. We're 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 good now. I think on Facebook there might have been a brief uh, interruption there. So apologies to anyone who, who might have missed anything. Um, hopefully not. Um, and we did have some questions in the Facebook stream. And um, you know, in terms of follow, we'll we'll try to do our best to follow up on those individually. And uh, for folks uh, who do have questions, though, again, maybe you could re reiterate one final time. We just have about two minutes left. What's the best way? And again, we're, some folks are watching this, and some people are just listening on on the radio. Uh, what is the best way to follow up with detailed questions for each of your organizations? I'll start again. The the yeah. the, uh, the email address for DLC would be the best way to do that, okay. which is mail at dlc hyphen ma dot org. And for us, you could reach out through our website, which is one eight uh, workwithoutlimits.org. Uh, there is a contact us button in the top right. You could fill out that form and your question would then be routed to the appropriate uh, staff member. And by phone, you can reach us at 877-937-9675. And for the Ark of Massachusetts, um, I encourage you to uh, visit the website, um, thearcofmass.org. And if you have specific questions, I'm more than happy to be contacted. My email at the ARC is Mahoney, M-A-H-O-N-E-Y, at arcmass.org. Great. And again, I just want to reiterate to folks who may be listening, we're um, joined here by House Chairwoman uh, Kay Khan, the Joint Committee on Children, Families, and Persons with Disabilities. And uh, I know that our committee and our great staff, uh, thank you, by the way, to all our great staff that helped out with this event. Um, are here to help and be a resource, and we definitely want to be that. So if you have questions of a, a legislative nature or policy-related questions, please let us know. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Kay just for some final remarks, but I want to thank all of our great panelists for participating today. Uh, we had a lot of great material. I think we covered a lot of almost everything, not quite, uh, but almost everything. And I want to really thank you for taking the time out and for all that you do to be an advocate for folks with disabilities. So thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks, uh, PAC TV, for all the great work. And I'll I'll now let uh, the Chairwoman Khan uh, have a final word. Uh, thank you, Representative Cutler. And I want to again thank you for uh, putting this all together uh, and uh, all the work that you've been doing as, uh, with the subcommittee uh, of our committee. And
and it's really all very important work. And I want to thank all of you who came today to participate. I think you gave, we got wonderful information. Um, and uh, again, people can contact any one of us if they have any more questions. Uh, we're happy to be available. And really, I think I, I am very impressed with the disability community uh, as a whole. I think uh, you do amazing work and we um, have been very fortunate. I think we're fortunate to live here in Massachusetts where there are so many good things going on. And we also have uh, obviously lots of connections across the country uh, with what's going on in other states. So I think we're again, very fortunate to have you, um, really fortunate to have Representative Cutler who has uh, really uh, put a lot of effort into all that he does uh, as a member of the committee and our subcommittee. And uh, just really appreciate having the opportunity to be here this morning. Um, I've notified uh, the uh, Newton New TV about this, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to connect and have it uh, shown in, in my community. And again, just want to thank everybody for the opportunity to be here this morning. Great. We, we need thank to turn it back over to, to Julie uh, at PAC TV at the back of the home base uh, to close us out. Julie, are you there? Yeah, thank you so much, Josh. And yeah, there's a couple glitches today in technology. Um, sometimes the bandwidth goes in and out. Uh, just be assured that the recording of this will be able to be seen in its entirety, uh, pactv.org slash regional. So any, if you missed anything for any reason, your internet, whatever, um, it, it is available there. We date stamp this as we do every, everything that we record here at PACTV so you know that the information that you received today was date specific. Josh, thank you so much for putting together these regional forums. You do different subjects each week and they are really timely and really valuable. My one question is, all the resources that were um, talked about today, will those be available on your website or where, where can people go for the general all out uh, sense of resourcing from today's show? Yeah, Julie, we'll, we'll be happy. I'll, we'll take all the, the websites and everything from all of our great panelists, and uh, I'll put them on my, my website, and I'm sure Chairwoman Khan can do that as well. Excellent. Thank you so much, and thank you, guests. This was a really informative, really packed uh, information, packed full hour. We appreciate that. This is Julie Thompson from PAC-TV wishing you a good day.